Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. Stand with me. I need some help today. All right. We have come into his house to worship him. It's all about him. Let's sing it. We have come into his house. This is part of the manual of the Church of the Nazarene. We will be doing this this coming Wednesday night. This coming Wednesday's board meeting at 8 p.m. will conclude the meeting filling out a pastoral and board member review. At the conclusion, Ron Carter, the church board secretary, will gather them up, take them to the district superintendent, who will calculate the results and schedule a meeting to go over the results. As you may know, over 20 years ago, a pastor would face a recall election by the entire church every year, or every other year, depending on if he was given an extended call. There are a lot of misunderstandings that took place under this plan, as many of the congregation really did not know how the pastor functioned, seeing him only on Sunday and Wednesday as a rule. So the General Assembly voted to change the pastoral recall. Here is a brief description. After serving the initial two years, the pastor and board would have the first pastoral vote. If satisfactory, then every four years, the DS would meet with the church board and do a review of the pastor and the church board performance. So that will be taking place. It's been four years since we have done that, and we will be doing that uh, Wednesday night, and then we will be meeting with the district superintendent at a later date. We're glad you're here today. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. Let's go to Him in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, as we bow in Your presence at the beginning of this service, we just pause, Lord, to tell You that we love You and we thank You for Your many blessings upon our lives. And as we gather today in Your name, Lord, I pray that our worship and our praise would be such that it would be pleasing to You. Bless in everything that we say and do this morning that it might lift up Praise and glorify the wonderful name of Jesus. For it's in name we pray. Amen. Gary? Thank you. Would you stand one more time with me? Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. What a privilege it is to be able to be here and sing His praises. You know, there could be any number of things happen to any one of us this week. 
You shouldn't take it for granted to be here, to be able to sing praises of the Lord.
we know Sharon's warm. I didn't know whether the pastor might be checking to see if some of us were dead or not. When he asked that question, you know, a little warmth is necessary. All right. At the cross, page 229. That means grab the hymnal in front of you, please. And sing like you're standing up. First, second, third, and last. Let's see here, wait a minute. That's already washed in the blood. Uh, number three, I believe. That was a good one, and I was about to take off with it. Thank you. 
Father, what a joy it is to come into your presence again with the knowledge that no matter how rough or how bad the day looks, you've already been through it and it's going to be okay. We're thankful we serve one who's not just a piece of wood or stone or some little idol, but a living God who's vitally interested in each and every one of our problems, our needs, our concerns, and all the things that we find to worry about. But Lord, all through your words, you've told us not to worry, not to be anxious over anything. We're reminded that if you gave your one and only son for us, will you not with him also give us everything? Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow, for each day has enough problems of its own. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you as well. Help us, Lord, to just keep our eyes centered upon you. And help us, Lord, to know that as soon the last trump will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and then we which are alive will meet Jesus in the air. What a day that will be. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for being with us, and for meeting all of our needs. And Lord, as we say each and every Sunday, we are indeed a needy people. We've got so much sickness in our church today. We think of Jeanette that's home today sick. We just pray for her in a special way. Restore her health. And Lord, we pray for Gary that you touch him. And then, Father, we thank Vicki that's suffering from her uh, disc problems in her back. And we just lift her up and pray that you bring healing to her. And give the doctors guidance and wisdom as they work with her. And we pray for Shirley that's dealing with some physical problems. Ask that you just touch her in a special way. And then, Lord, we lift up Cynthia to you that's having some special health issues. And Lord, we just pray that you give the doctor guidance and wisdom and help them to take care of that problem that she's dealing with. Lord, we know that Kathy's dealing with migraines and some other issues, and we just pray that you would touch her and be close to her in a special way. We pray, Father, for Bonnie and Norma and the health issues that they're facing. And then, Lord, we think of O.D., who's homesick today, and we just pray that you touch him. And let him know that his church family is lifting him up. Father, we think of Una and Clara. Not you, but we think of Clara and Maggie and Lucy, Lord, that you touch each of them and draw close to them in a special way. And Father, we uh, just pray today that uh, your presence would be with each of us. And then, Lord, we think of uh, Tammy Mann that's just had gallbladder surgery, and we just pray that you would help her as she recovers from the, the surgery and touch her in a special way. And then, Lord, that we rejoice that uh, through this terrible accident that Charles and Nancy were in, that they weren't hurt physically. Mm -hmm. We can replace vehicles, but it's hard to replace the old bones. And we do thank you, Lord, that you had your hand over them and you were watching and taking care of them. Lord, we, we see our altar. There's lots and lots of needs that are represented here. And we lift each one of them up to you. And pray, Father, that you just minister. You know specifically what's going on in each life. You know the needs, you know the burden. You do. Father, I know there are moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas that are lifting, let's say, children up that just need a very special touch from you. Give them fruit for their labor. Let them just sense your presence. Work miracles in their lives. Father, we think of the election, we think of the new women, men and women who've been put in positions of responsibility and I pray Lord that you bless them give them guidance and wisdom and help them to realize that indeed we are one nation under God and help us not forget that help us not to think about political parties but help us to think about Americans and help us to think about the greatest country in the world that you allowed to be and I pray Lord that you just bless in a special way Father, we pray that you bless our president, our vice president, our congress, our state, county, and city leaders. And I pray, Lord, especially for the Church of the Nazarene and our general superintendents, just bless them. Give them guidance and special wisdom as they direct our church. And we pray for our own district leadership, Brother Russ and Gail. Bless them. Continue to draw close to them and give them special encouragement. Continue to have your hand upon Gail as she's healing from this past surgery. Bless her, we pray. We pray 
also for Leslie that's had that same surgery. And we pray that you continue to have your hand to bring healing to her. And then, Lord, we know that a lot of our folks are deer hunting today. And we pray your safety on them. And, Lord, I pray that you just watch over each and every one of us. Meet all of our needs. And Father, as we pray each Sunday, we ask now that you walk around her altar and up and down each pew. And would you give each one of us that big daddy's hug that we all need. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. 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 Say it. For those who can stand, would have you stand. If you can't stand, that's perfectly all right. You just stay seated. This is Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Father, we just to thank the Lord for your presence this morning. Thanks you, Lord, for your love for us. We ask you to be with us today, Lord, this beautiful day you've given us today. Touch each one today. Amen. Amen. <coughs> there was a man walking around the beach and he came upon a lamp. He picked it up and rubbed it and a genie popped out. And the genie said, because you released me from thousands of years of punishment and imprisonment, I shall grant you one wish. What's your wish? man thought for all oh, good men, gave a lot of consideration, said, here's my wish. He said, uh, next year, I'm going to be married. I'm going to have a honeymoon in Hawaii. But I'm terribly afraid of flying. So I want you to build me a bridge all the way to Hawaii. Jenny looked at him and got a real stern look on his face. And he said, you don't know what you're asking. Do you have any idea the work that that would take? And the money that it would cost, well, I'd have to pay millions of dollars to the workers to build it. And the material that would be involved, there would be countless rest stops and gas stations and food places. And a bridge like that would interfere with all of the shipping lanes and it would never pass an environmental study. You just don't have to come up with another wish. And he said, okay. And he thought of it and he said, well, like I said, I'm going to get married next year. Let me understand how women operate and how they think. Jeannie looked at him and said, Now this bridge, did you want that double lane and four lanes? And you want a single deck or double deck? You know, some challenges seem impossible on their face, yet when they place alongside others, they kind of pale in comparison, don't they? What in the world for Jesus really isn't that big of a deal when you talk about witnessing to your neighbor. Witnessing to your neighbor compared to what in the world for Jesus, there's a lot of difference there, isn't there? Starting a Bible study in your home may seem like a big task, but it really pales in comparison to starting a church, doesn't it? A lot of things that are, we kind of think aren't that big of a deal, or we think they are a big of a deal until we compare it to some of God's bigger plans. One man said it this way, dare to dream big things for God. Dare to dream big things for God. He said a vision for God which expects little and seems all too possible is really not a real goal. It's nothing more than a daydream. Dream big things for God. The title of the sermon this morning is The Power of a Carefree Mind. The power of a carefree mind. If you'd like to fill in the blanks here, we go with the first one. The cares of life can make us powerless. 
Now, I'm going to be using the word cares, but there's some synonyms for cares that we're probably more familiar with. Worry, anxiety. If we're really macho people, we say we're concerned. But I'll probably use cares most of the time here. You know, when we focus on problems, it kind of weakens our faith, doesn't it? If all we do is go to sleep worrying about things and wake up worrying about things, we're not going to get a whole lot accomplished for Jesus, are we? There was a dying man that had a great fear of death because it was the unknown. So he called his minister and he said, your minister, tell me, what is heaven like? The minister looked at him and he said, well, sir, I really don't know what heaven's like. Never been there. And the sick man said, well, what kind of a minister are you that you don't know what heaven's like? And he said, well, let me try to help you understand it. He said, I have a wonderful dog that loves me and would follow me anywhere. And that dog would go into any room, even a room that he'd never been into before, as long as he knew that I was going to be there. And you know, it's kind of like heaven. I've never been to heaven. I really don't know exactly what it's going to be like. But one thing I do know, my master's going to be there. And so it's going to be okay. Amen. Worries or cares or concerns drain the potential of the mind. Cares are often idolized by looking at money and things of pleasure. Mark 4.19, listen to what Jesus said. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of life, the lure of wealth, and desire for other things, so that no fruit is produced. And in Luke 8, 14, Jesus said the seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares or the worries and the riches and pleasures of this life, and they never grow into maturity. Did you know that worry can keep us from expecting Christ's return? Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 21, 34. He said, watch out. Be alert. Be sober. Wake up. Don't let my sudden coming catch you unawares. And don't let me find you living in careless ease, carousing and drinking and occupied with the problems of this life like all the rest of this world. Let me tell you something. Tough things come our way. Amen. Bad things do happen to good people. Right. Did you know that? Yeah. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Yeah. So when tough times come, we shouldn't think, why are they coming my way? But we should rejoice that we've been kind of worthy to suffer in Jesus' name. But don't worry about things. The next point, Paul tells us, have a carefree mind. Have a carefree mind. He said, be careful or be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about all kinds of stuff. Jesus said, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For each day has enough trouble of its own. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got enough problems, let alone adding to them things that are unnecessary. So many times we worry about things that never come our way, don't we? Right. Jesus said, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you as well. Listen to what Jesus said here. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He takes care of them. And are you not much more valuable than they are? Can any of you, now listen to what he's saying here, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No. Can't do it, can you? No. <clears throat> and then he goes on and says, well, why worry about your clothes? You see how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor, they don't spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass in the field which is here today and burned up tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? 
So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. Pagans meaning the non-Christians, those who don't know Jesus as Lord. And here's one of my favorite verses in Romans. It said this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Worrying is really not part of the Christian vocabulary. In reality, it shouldn't be, but it is, isn't it? God's going to take care of us. But, let me put a beware in there. That doesn't mean that you don't have to use the God-given talents and abilities that He's given to you. We went to Colorado Springs. You know all the stories I've told you. Found out the jobs were few and far between out there. And the ones that were available didn't pay what I was used to making. But I took a job. I just believed that it was my responsibility to work. So I went to college and I worked. We had enough money that we paid the bills. But there wasn't anything left over. And I made, didn't hardly make enough to get by. But I made too much to get any kind of Pell Grants from a college. And if you've had kids and you know what that... That's frustrating too, isn't it? And so, you know, I was in a situation where I knew what it was to have a lot, and out there I knew what it was to have little. But you know, when I had little is when I got closer to God, when I trusted more in God, because He did so many miraculous miracles in the lives of the Comings family while we were out there. He took care of us and provided for us in a special way. But I did my part. I believe that. God called me to be a pastor, but he also called me to go to school. And in that schooling, it wasn't for me just to go out there and just say, well, bless God you've called me and I don't have to work because you're going to provide every dollar. It's not the way God works. And so I had to pay my way through college. I had to pay for my books. And God took care. He provided the money. He was always just surprising us every time we turned around. Sometimes it scared us to death. The way he did it. But you know, he always took care of us. But on the other hand, I had some student friends out there that started school the same time I did. And here was their logic. God's called me to be a minister and I have to go back to get some education. So I know that God doesn't want me to have to work. So I'm not going to work. And God's going to take care of everything else. So they got all kinds of food stamps. They got government aids. Their entire college bill was paid for. They even got low rent housing. And they had it pretty easy, they didn't have to work. And I must be kind of honest with you, that kind of irritated me a little bit. I was working my tail off and we didn't have any extra. I mean, there was these other fellows that didn't work. But you know, after I've had time to think about it, they, they never had the opportunity to see God take care of them. The government took care of them. The government provided everything for them. And as I kept tabs on a lot of the students who graduated with me, just about every one of those fellows that never worked, they didn't last two years in the ministry. And I'm going on 27 years because I learned to trust in God. Amen. And I realized it wasn't all about me. It wasn't all about Uncle Sam. It was all about God. And so God expects us not to worry, but he also says to us, use what gifts I've given you, what talents that you have in your abilities. Now, the next one. Paul's saying to us that we're not supposed to worry. That should be our goal in life. Well, how in the world can we achieve this goal? Well, number one, we must trust instead of tremble. It's almost a King James word, isn't it? We don't use tremble too much anymore. A lot of times we worry about things and we may not physically tremble, but mentally we're trembling. Not, we're scared to death. How in the world are we going to get through this? Back in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 11, the scripture says, O Lord, they pay no attention to your upraised fist. Show them your eagerness to defend your people, and then they will be ashamed, and let your fire consume your enemies. Anxiety or worry prevents achievement. Consider the potential of a mind that's free from fear. Have you ever, you remember the story I told you, I don't know, it's been years and years and years ago about this adult that happened to see this 
what we call midget league baseball game going on, and he didn't know any of the kids, but he saw it, and he'd had some time, and he said, well, I think I'm going to stop and watch that. And he watched this pitcher, probably about three and a half foot tall. He was throwing the ball and walking about everybody that he, who was getting up to the plate. And finally, after what seemed like an hour, they managed to get three outs on the other team, and they went in, and the pitcher was kind of walking around, and the man walked up to him, and he said, son, he said, I've been watching your game, and gave him his name, said, what's your name, he shared with him, and he said, well, let me ask you something. He said, the score is 22 to nothing, and this is just the bottom of the first inning. Are you worried? The kid said, heck no, mister, we're just not getting up to bat. <laughs> See the difference? If God is with us, all things are possible, aren't they? Amen. If God is with us, think of all the inventions and the accomplishments that came because of focused thinking. I read an illustration not too long ago. It talked about the African in the palace. said he could jump to a height of over 10 foot and that he could take leaps greater than 30 feet. Yet these magnificent creatures can be kept in an enclosure in any zoo with a three foot fence. Why? Because the animals will not jump if they cannot see where their feet are going to lay. They will not jump if they can't see where their feet are going to land after a jump. Hmm. Faith is the ability to trust what we cannot see. And with faith, we are freed from the flimsy enclosures of life that fear allows to entrap us. Do you know the average person's anxiety is focused on 40% of things that will never happen? Never. 30% of things about the past that you can't change. We all have a past, don't we? We have all done things that we wish we could go back and change, don't we? Yeah. But you can. If it results in a sin on your part, you need to confess it to God. If you've offended a person, confess it to them. And then go ahead. Press on toward the goal which set before us. So what Paul said, don't stay in the past. Go forward. And here's another big one that probably might be a little bit higher today. 12% of people worry about things that are criticisms from others that are usually untrue. If you ever are in a position of leadership of any kind, and I'm not talking about necessarily in church, whatever you do, somebody's going to be critical of you. Yeah. Somebody's going to point their finger at you and say, what a terrible job you did. It's going to happen. There's going to be people that are going to point their finger at you and say, you did so and so, and it's an outright bold lie. Just the way life is. Mm -hmm. When that happens, you dismiss them. You go on, but you trust in God. And then 10% of the things we worry about are health situations. And you know, the doctors have told us that worrying about our health can actually cause our health to decrease. You know, worrying about Things like that cause stress, and stress can cause you to get sick. And then 8% are about the real problems that we have to face and that we will conquer. We always do. We always get by the big things, don't we? We just do. God helps us. And did you know that when you are showing fear, it always affects somebody else? I was thinking... Uh, the other day, back in the, probably the middle 70s, we had bought a new black, jet black Buick with Sabre Custom, and it was a nice car. It was a big engine, and boy, it was a nice car. Leather seats, just fancy as I'll get out. And one night after church, we went over to face sister's house and visited with her and her husband for a while. And we said, well, we got to get back. Kids got to school in the morning, blah, blah, blah. So we took off. They lived on the west side of Columbus. We lived on the east side of Columbus. And so we got off on Hamilton Road off the interstate. Speed limit was 35. I was going 35. But our fairly new black, the super custom Buick. I was very proud of that car. You probably don't know that. We were just driving along, and all of a sudden, this rattle trap piece of junk pulled alongside me and just shot up ahead of me. Two probably 18, 19 year old teenage boys were in it. And I thought, well, they're in a big hurry. Where's the police when, they, when you want them, you know? 
they pulled in front of me and it slowed down to 20. You can imagine I was not real pleased with that. And so I thought, well, okay. So I got in the other lane to go around them and they speeded up. I got up to 40 and they were going faster. So well, I'm not going to get a ticket. So I pulled back behind them and they slowed down to 20 again. By now I was really getting irritated about it. And the face said, well, what are you going to do? I said, look at what you're riding in and look at that car. I can leave them sentence. She said, you can take it to I'm thinking, well, there's no place around now. So one more time, I pulled alongside them and they speeded up. I got behind them, they slowed down to 20. And I said, I've had it. <laughs> I tromped that thing. <laughs> I was kind of sitting with pride, you know. And they were trying to catch me, but they couldn't. And then they said, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? We're going to get a ticket. I said, just calm down. It's going to be okay. And sure enough, when I slowed back down, they pulled up alongside me again. Yeah. And I thought, okay. I didn't let, they didn't know that my turnoff was about 150 foot to the right. So I didn't put my turn signal on and they zoomed past me and I went, suckers! <laughs> and they zoomed on past me. And I went, faked them out. So we went down our road, turned on the other road that goes into our little housing area and I made a right turn. Turned on my street, and I was just maybe two houses away from our house, and I looked in my rearview mirror, mirror, and there was that rattle-trap car. Uh. Now I'm angry. I didn't know what they were going to do, didn't think. I was angry. The kids knew I was upset. Faith knew I was upset. I said, get the kids and get in. What are you going to do, Steve? I said, get the kids and get in the house. <laughs> and I walked down to the end of the street to our driveway, and I just stood there. They went by me, and I'm like this. Yeah. yeah. Um, it looks like you. Now I'm six foot two, or I was six foot two. And I was in pretty good shape. But I, yeah. I heard some noise, and the kids are in the car pounding on the window. And Faith is getting ready to go in the house. I said, Faith, get the kids out of the car. They're scared to have a training, this trainee. And they were checking all the meters, and they got to the very last house in the alley, and they saw the lady in the house was looking out watching them. And they checked that meter out and finally the old guy decided he was going to show this young whippersnapper. He says, let's have a race back to the truck and see who can win. So they took off running for all they're worth. And just as they get to their truck, they hear somebody else coming up puffing and puffing. They turn around. It was that lady from that last house who had been watching them. And the man said, lady, what in the world's wrong with you? She said, all I know is when I see two gas meter guys, the look at my meter and they're running as fast as they can. I decided I needed to be running too. <laughs> you know, faith and fear are direct opposites, aren't they? Direct opposites. Faith is what brings us salvation, security, and peace. And a peaceful mind is a powerful mind. Faith is what drives fear away. Placing everything within our reach. In Mark 9, 23, Jesus had uh, just got into a discussion with a man that needed his little son to be healed. And he said, well, if, if you can. Jesus looked at him and said, what do you mean, if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. And then in Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. So faith is dead to doubts, dumb to discouragement, blind to impossibilities, and knows nothing about success. Wish I could tell you that I quoted that, but I didn't. I read it. That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Next blank. We must forgive instead of fume. Forgive instead of fume. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 tells us, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So Christian, how are we to handle bitterness, wrath, anger, and malice? These hindrances to power have to be put away because anger 
is a roadblock to accomplishment. I read a story many years ago, there was a Knicks and a Bullets playoff game, and one of the Bullets came up to the great Walt Frazier and punched him right in the face. And the same thing about it, the ref called the foul on Frazier. Frazier didn't say a single word. His expression on his face didn't change. But he simply called for the ball the next seven times his team had it and made seven baskets and they won the game. If you want to get huffy about it, you could say there was a great moral lesson there too, couldn't you? But it was an amazing display of productive anger. They tell me that if a rattlesnake gets cornered, then sometimes you leave him by himself. Well, hear me. That is exactly what happens when you harbor hate and resentment towards somebody who's offended you or who's hurt you. It's like biting yourself. Biting yourselves. We think that we're harming somebody else, but in reality, we're not harming them, we're harming ourselves. Consider what anger did to Cain. The scripture says that Cain brought an offering to the Lord, and Abel brought an offering to the first fruits of the flock. Well, the Lord accepted Abel's, but he didn't accept Cain's because he wasn't the best. And so Cain went out and sought. And you know the next thing that happened, he killed his brother. Anger robs us of the power to bless others. If you're angry with someone, you're not going to be saying, oh, I want to bless that person today, are you? Every time you see that person's face in your mind, you're thinking, mm, if I could just give him five, you know? <laughs> Love to give him five. Yeah. Anger stifles Christian fellowship and service. But in verse 32, Paul is telling us that forgiveness is the antidote to anger. Whenever I get upset with faith, she'll say, well, you may as well forgive me. You're going to have to anyway. <laughs> that doesn't help the situation for a while. But you know, I think about it. She's right. Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother who's right here in front of you, God won't forgive us if we don't forgive our brothers and sisters. Do you know that? Amen. Forgiveness is the antidote to anger. So Paul says, be kind to one another, forgiving one another. And forgiveness always includes fellowship. There was a pastor that was talking to a Christian lady in his flock who got offended by somebody, and she was really angry with this lady. And she said, I am not going to have anything to do with her. I don't want to see her. I don't want to talk about her. Don't mention her name. She's bad news. She hurt me. And that's it. Period. And the minister said, well, is that, is that the way a Christian is supposed to act? She said, no, you're right. She said, I'll forgive her like you said, but I'm sure I'm not going to have anything to do with her. The pastor looked at him and said, is that what you want God to do with you? When you, when you sin and you ask God to forgive you, you want him to forgive you, but then you want him to pull away from his fellowship and his love and his companionship with you. Is that what you want? And she thought about it and she said, no, that's not what I want. And sometimes we have to understand that people do things that are going to hurt your feelings. Just the way it is. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not. They don't even realize that, that they've hurt you. And sometimes it's, if you're close to them, sometimes it seems like your best friends are the ones that can do the most damage to you, or family members. You know, in reality, I found that a lot of times they don't even realize they did it. And so what happens, we begin to harbor a grudge, and that grudge turns into bitterness, and before you know it, it turns into a sin cancer and begins to eat away at you. One of the things that will help us, and doesn't always work, is sometimes if we have the opportunity to talk to that person and say, can I share something with you? Yeah. When you did so-and-so, or when you said so-and-so, it hurt my feelings. That's not an attack, is it? You're opening yourself up to them. But, let me also remind you that sometimes that can make it worse. If that person was maliciously out to hurt you and you say, well, you hurt me, they're going to get it. I know how to get at you. Now I'm really going to come after you. 
So you need to use some wisdom in a situation like that too. But many times people say things and do things to you they don't really mean to. It just comes out. I found a long time ago that sometimes some of the people who were in a position of authority over me said things and did things and I couldn't understand why they were so nasty. But then I began to, with my melancholy personality, I began to analyze what they were doing. I watched them. And I found out they had a lot of problems. They had a lot of emotional problems themselves. Uh, and they were, they were defeated. And so what happens when we get down on ourselves, sometimes we rationalize it away by blaming everybody else for what's going on in our lives. So sometimes it helps you understand, just watch people and understand, okay, why are they acting this way? And sometimes that's what it is. And sometimes they just need somebody to love them. Sometimes they need someone to say, hey, this one you know is thinking about you, I'm praying for you. Forgiveness is the antidote to anger. And then forgiveness opens up the channel of power. In the washroom of a London sporting club, a British newspaper publisher and politician named William Beverbrook happened to meet a young man named Edward Heath, who was a young member of Parliament, about whom Beverbrook had printed a very insulting editorial a few days earlier. And after he had a chance to think about it, he came face to face with the guy. He used that English jargon on him. He said, my dear chap, I'm embarrassed by what I did. And I'm here apologizing to you for what I've written. And I hope you'll forgive me. And he kind of grunted. He said, very well. But listen to what he said. But the next time, I wish you would insult me in the washroom and apologize in your newspaper. <laughs> Forgiveness between people is easy. In fact, sometimes it often leaves a messy process that leaves both sides feeling hurt. But understand that God's forgiveness is always perfect forgiveness. Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west. So if you go to God and confess your sins to him, he's promised that he's going to forgive us and forget about it. It's not there. Now, we can't forget about it totally. We've talked about that. One of the things that I've shared with several of you many, many, many times, we have an enemy named Satan. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. And he delights in living in the past, especially your past. He knows all the dumb things that you've done, and he delights in bringing up those dumb things that you've done. I would submit to you, when he reminds you of things in areas where you have fallen, maybe even outright sin, what you say is this, Satan, you know, you're right. I really didn't mess up back then. But let me tell you something. Thank you for reminding me that Jesus forgave me of that and it's under the blood. Man, that makes me feel like singing a song. Let's sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Do you want to sing the first verse of the chorus? <laughs> James says, resist the devil and he will flee. That's how you do it. Believe me, Satan does not want to lead a praise course lifting up the name of Jesus. So every time he brings up your past, thank him for reminding you that it's under the blind. Isn't it great to know that? And then that last one, we must release instead of retain. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares. Cast all your worries, cast all your anxiety on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. He's concerned with what's going on in your life. We can cast all of our cares on Christ and then be free of them. You know, we have a decision to make. Am I going to trust Christ and let Him do what He wants to do? He's the one that said, all you that are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. So that means if I've got a problem that I, that's bigger than me, I'm going to give it to Him and let Him take care of it. We talk about laying our cares, our burdens, our concerns on the altar all the time, don't we? And we do that, and we kind of get up and we feel good. We've given it to Jesus. 
And then two days down the road, we get thinking about it, and we say, you know what? I can, I can probably take care of that one, Jesus, and we come back and pick it up from the altar, and then we make a bigger mess than what we had started out with. So we have a decision to make. Are we going to give our burdens, our cares, our anxieties, our worries to Him and then let Him take care of it? Or are we going to worry about it? Holding on to your cares, your worries, your concerns, it just makes you weak and weary. You ever get weary of just worrying about things? When we release our cares to Jesus, it sets us free. In classic Peanuts comic strip, uh, Lucy asked Charlie Brown if he worries about people, worries about the world blowing up. Charlie said, well, that depends. What day is this? She said, well, today is Tuesday. He said, no, on Tuesdays, I just worry about personality problems. <laughs> Thursdays are the day that I worry about the world blowing up. <laughs> you know, most of us can't compartmentalize. Most of us cannot compartmentalize yeah. our worries, our concerns like Charlie does. But maybe we should just remember the Bible admonition to be anxious for nothing. Cast all your cares on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. Your worrying's not going to change anything, is it? No. Cast all your cares on Him. God loves us. Christ died for us. God commended His love toward us in this while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And if He gave His one and only Son for us, won't He through Christ give us all other things that we need? Amen. That's where the trust comes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He will direct your paths. We're talking about a total commitment of self to Him. You still have to utilize the talents, the gifts that God's given you. That doesn't mean you like my student friends out of college. Well, I'm not going to do anything because God's in charge of it. You still have to do and use what He's given you. But understand that the cross proves His love for you. And the good thing about it is when you totally let yourself be given over to God, God's love can be a channel that goes right through you to other people. Do you know that people watch you? Did you know that? Some of you know. Really? Yes. He does. The way you react is either a red rose or a dead rose for the cause of Christ. I like roses. Love roses. I think they're beautiful. Especially the red ones. They're so beautiful. They're so... Just, you just love being around them. But you know what? After you have them for so long and you don't do anything with them, they get kind of nasty looking, don't they? Yeah. Let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we're to be a light unto the world. So I encourage you, don't worry. Keep on trusting, <clears throat> forgiving, and releasing God's power. Does God love you? Yeah. Yeah. Do you love God? I hope so. Stand with me. Sharon Gray, would you close in prayer for us? Oh Lord, we're just so grateful for the word that has come to us today. We're thankful for all that have come out, Lord. This is our family. You have spoken to my heart today, Lord. And just help us to remember these points that Pastor has given us, Lord about trusting and forgiving and releasing. Lord, that seems to be the hardest one. Sometimes we just want to hang on to something that's just going to really come back to hurt us and it's not doing any good. Help us, Lord. Help me, Lord, to be able to turn things over to you and to just release that control. Amen. We praise your name, Lord, for all your many blessings. Just continue to help us to grow individually and as, as a church. To give you all the praise and honor and glory. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.